welcome back. Dr. Jay Smith here in my office, and we're still continuing with this whole problem of where is Islam? Where is Waldo? Where is Muhammad? Where is Islam? Where is the Quran? Where is Mecca? Now we're looking at the inscriptions to try to help us with this problem, this dilemma. And I've brought on board uh, Mel from Sneakers Corner. You know his YouTube site. Go up on it. He's been in introducing new material all the time. And I, he wants to look at these rock inscriptions. Now, I've always been skeptical of rock inscriptions, and you'll see why as we go through this. Because for me, I don't know how you can date rock inscriptions. And I, one of the first questions I'm going to ask Mel is that very thing. So, Mel, welcome. Thanks for coming on board. Great to, to be back, yeah. Uh, now, you've got some inscriptions you're going to be introducing to us. Uh, these are inscriptions that uh, you have put together from a book. That, uh, in fact, let me just let you introduce it. Go and tell us about these inscriptions. Okay, so the, I suppose the key idea behind looking at the rock inscriptions is that if the Islamic tradition is true, that there was a, a prophet called Muhammad, and he set up a religion in the early part of the 7th century, and he was hugely popular, hugely influential, the first thing that you would expect is that you would find loads of evidence of inscriptions um, praising this prophet and maybe references to people going on, on their hajj and uh, you know things like that. But when we look at the uh, evidence across a, a vast area in Arabia and other, and other parts of the, of the Middle East, we find that there's an absence of references to that religion in the seventh century. In fact, there is no reference to Muhammad that has been found so far on the rock inscriptions, which is very strange indeed. Yeah. Okay, so if he is that important, he should be everywhere. We can't even find him in any place, is what you're saying from prior to 690. You're going to say that. Now, let's go ahead, and you have a PowerPoint that you're going to share with us looking at yeah. the inscription. So go ahead. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll keep talking and trying to uh, I try to make sure that everybody is on board with where we're going to go with this. As he brings up this PowerPoint, remember we're looking at rock inscriptions that are in the Middle East. Now, I think you used a book, this one here. This is the book that you've been using, Crossroads to Islam by Yehudo Nemo and Judith Corin. Am I correct? That's right, yeah. So, um, so. Yehuda Nevo was primarily concerned with the Negev area and around Damascus, and that's obviously a very important area in terms of rock inscriptions because that is where all the evidence is pointing to in terms of where Islam began. Um, but as I'm going to show you later, um, I'm going to complement his work with a later scholar from Finland, um, who I'll, I'll tell you about in a moment, and he has looked at a uh, hundred other uh, dated inscriptions from a, a wider area and this is a paper from 2019 so it's, it's the most up-to-date um, if you like paper on this whole I oh, issue. Last year you're saying, a paper that just came out last year. Just came out last year yeah so so as of June 2020. 2003 so we're talking about well, we're talking about 17 years ago the paper you're going to refer to was just a year ago. Exactly. So the story is pretty much the same as when Neville wrote his book. It, it hasn't met any um, major challenge in terms of the rock inscriptions. The, the record that's there seems to be painting the same picture. And uh, I suppose the one thing I would point out that when we're talking about evidence that we're finding through rock inscriptions, they are relatively provisional because all it will take is an inscription to be found tomorrow and then this could overturn our findings. But as of June 2020, this is where it stands. I mean, this is evidence. Before you go on, though, how do they date these inscriptions? How do they know that the dates that they're going to give are accurate? Well, first of all, um, the, the, the key inscriptions that we're going to be looking at have dates written by the, the inscribers themselves. Um, so that's that's a uh, definite uh, uh, method of knowing. So they, they literally have data themselves. In other cases, um, in, in the way Neville has uh, grouped inscriptions, he has grouped them in, in, in order of development of ideas. The same way, for example, if you were to look at videos of a YouTube channel, 
you, even if you didn't have dates on them, you would probably guess that the more primitive ones were the earlier ones, and then the more developed ones were later ones. You mean the script um, itself, the, the, the printed script is change, changes? Um, well, there's that, yeah, there's in terms of the style of script, there's also the theological ideas that are contained or absent from them. So if you have less of certain types of theological ideas that would suggest an earlier per period, where as um, more developed theological idea on an inscription would suggest a much later period. But in terms of the key thing, uh, in terms of uh, Muhammad, it, and a dated inscription of Muhammad, what we find is that there's none from the seventh century. Um, the rest is, if you like, um, supportive material, um, maybe is not as, as strong, you know, in terms of Neville's ideas that certain material is from an earlier period based on um, a number of considerations. Okay, um, I think in terms this up, Mel, the reason why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of some of the things, of uh, the dates that he's gonna put up is because of, what we saw with the Ashtanami, the Ashtanami, the letters of Muhammad, which everybody assumed were legitimate. And from the 16, from the 1500s, from the 16th century, this was always supposed and assumed these letters were from Muhammad because Muhammad's name is on it. And because Muhammad's handprint is on it, done by these, uh, these monks. But we, but it was, it wasn't until the 1900s that you had a German scholar who looked at them and showed that there was internally, there were some real problems here uh, because it, it had it, it had the different it had the wrong kind of Arabic from that time period. It had the wrong phraseology from that time period. It even had pictures of minarets which didn't exist to the 11th and 12th century. And that this was then it was obvious that this was put together around 1500s. Yet even today, I still hear many Muslims suggesting that these are actually from Muhammad because his name's in it and his handprints on it. So that's why I'm wondering. Uh, I, I assume that Yehuda Nebo is not going something that simplistic. I assume he's looking at something much greater to be able to, be yeah. able to uh, date these so specifically. Well, w one, of the, one of the ways that kind of allow you to leapfrog from, from dated material to undated material is that the rock inscriptions were typically done by a small number of inscribers. So, you know, a family might go to an inscriber and pay money to have a rock inscription to record an important moment in that family, uh, maybe a prayer to Allah and so on. Um, so you would have, say, a particular, um, we'll call the person, the inscriber Abdul. He does one rock inscription, he puts a date. And so from that date, you can tell that the associated other inscriptions in the area with the same inscriber are from the same period. Now, obviously, that would be um, uh, less strong material than the, the primary dated material. Yeah. But um, it, it allows us to group broadly where inscriptions came from in terms of uh, the chronology. Okay. So, th there's, so there's that method and also uh, Nevo would be familiar with the gradual evolution of uh, the Arabic script over time. So he'd be able to refer to um, dated material and, and be able to group these inscriptions according to uh, other information like that. Okay, listen, I'm gonna give it over to you. You're on board, convince me. Like I said last time uh, with the caliphs and I said earlier about the Dome of the Rock, uh, I, convince me now that these inscriptions say what they say and do what they do and see what we see from the conclusions you come up with at the end. And I'll chime in maybe very once in a while if I have a difficulty or just to get, get help uh, clarify something that I am confused by. Over to you, Mel. It's all yours. Okay. Okay, so what evidence would I expect to see if the Islamic tradition of a prophet who began Islam in the 620s were true? Well, I would expect copious popular rock inscriptions that invoke Muhammad's name from his time and in the decades that follow, especially on the Hajj routes. So if in the 620s and 630s he is like a rock star and everyone thinks he's the, the greatest thing since sliced bread, You'd imagine on the Hajj routes, people would be writing inscriptions saying, you know, I met, I met Muhammad today, he, he's a great fellow or something to that effect. But we see a complete absence of any rock inscriptions uh, dated to the seventh century with Muhammad's name. So to give it some context, so far, there have been 30,000 rock inscriptions surveyed across Arabia, the Negev, Transjordan, and Syria. 
there may be as many as 100,000 in total. We don't know the, the full total of many that are there. But as of today, we have seen a quite a sizable amount of inscriptions, enough to be um, surprised by the absence of Muhammad's name in the seventh century and the absence of one particularly with a date next to it, which is really surprising, surprising considering that you'd expect people to um, want to commemorate certain occasions to do with Muhammad during his lifetime, but there's no uh, reference to him. Is there any references in these 30,000 to Mecca? Any reference to people called Muslims? Any reference to religion called Islam? And any reference to a book called the Quran? I can't answer that question. Um, that's the short, it's short answer to. I, I've taken a very narrow focus here. Um, all, all I would say is that when they do appear, they appear past a certain time frame. So we, we see things that are typically Islamic, for example, the ones that you mentioned, in a post 690 time frame. Okay. So we don't see we don't see them dated prior to 690, but when we do find them dated, we typically find them dated post 690. Okay. Um, so um, it, to complement his work, I've also looked at the work of Ilka Lindstedt, who wrote a paper in 2019, who is in, who is out, early Muslim identity through epigraphy and theory. And as you can see from the map here, he has covered a, quite a wide range of areas of interest. Um, and in his appendix, he has got a hundred written, or oh, sorry, a hundred dated inscriptions that he has used as an example of what he's talking about. But the key finding from him is prior to 690, you don't have any evidence of Islam. We don't have any reference to Muhammad, Islam, um, Muslim, and things like that. So that is the question I'm asking, and it looks like that he... Go back to that map again before you go any further. Yeah. I want to look at something. Take a look at where all those, those uh, triangles are. The big triangles are five inscriptions. The smaller ones are single inscriptions. Where do you notice most of them are? Most of them up in the north. <laughs> Absolutely. And I would like yeah. to know how many of those, the earliest ones are in the north, and how many of the earliest ones are in the south. It looks like, I, just by what I'm seeing here, twice as many inscriptions in the north of the big squares, one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six big squares in the north, only three in the south. We have a multiplicity of single squares in the north. That would suggest yeah. that, and that would support what we're already finding about the Qibla, what we're finding about the Quran, what we're finding about Arabic, and I would, what we're finding about all the buildings are in the north. Almost everything we know yeah. about Islam, the geography and all the rest is coming from that area where you're seeing all those triangles yeah. are, not from around Mecca and Medina down in the south. And I would suggest, I, would, I can't say so, it'd be interesting if we could ask him, are those ones in the south, are they post 690 or, or any of those prior to 690? Yeah, well, I, I would say that um, based on uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Al-Jalad, rock inscriptions are common across all the area. Um, uh, this just really represents the distribution of the particular uh, dated inscriptions that he focused on. So it's not necessarily that there were more in the north or more in the south in general, because there are also undated inscriptions. He focuses on dated I ones. what Jalad says. Dr. Jalad Al Jalad says very clearly that he doesn't see any Arabic reference, uh, Arabic text in the middle in this Hijaz. That's Medina and Mecca. That's the area of Medina and Mecca prior yeah. to uh, within the seventh century. It all comes post seventh century, uh, so in the eighth century and later. Absolutely, and actually, if if you were to draw a line, say from Medina across the map, and then um, you know view the southern chunk of Arabia from there. Um, the, the common script that was used up to that time was the Sabaic script, which is very like the Ethiopian script. It's a very different script. Um, now, there were other scripts as well, but it's significant. The script that matches up with what became modern Arabic is found in the northern part of Arabia. So if you take a line just north of Medina, everything there would, go, would match up with Ethiopia, which is just on the right, on the left side, across the Red Sea. That's all Ethiopia. That's, today it's Eritrea, but that would have been Abyssinia back then. So that's the precursor to what we now know as Eritrea and Ethiopia today. You're saying that, that almost all the writing comes from that part of the world, whereas the Arab, the Arabic that we use today all comes from the northern part, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. 
Yeah. So the Sabaic script, which uh, came originally from the Yemen and was highly influenced by the Ethiopic script, because obviously uh, the Ethiopians had conquered that part of the world for some time. Um, it, it was created in 600 BC. So it was in existence in Southern Arabia for a whopping 1200 years. Yeah. And what's interesting about that script as well, I'll just say in passing, is it was able to carry all the sounds of Arabic. Had they chosen to use it, it would have been a very sensible script to have you used, and, but instead they use a really ambiguous script, <laughs> the one that we, we see today that has caused all the problems for the Quran in terms of uh, di diacritical uh, marks and all the rest it of it. not so even accommodated it. it the, the Arabic that we existed at that time, that, in the seventh century, coming from the Nabataean area, much further north, up where all the, 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 the triangles are in the north, that area, that was, could not accommodate the Quran that we have today. The Quran that we have today had to, they had to create these dots. They had to create these vowels so that people could even understand what they were reading. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good stuff. So uh, Ilka Lindstedt, he gives 100 representative examples of dated rock inscriptions between the year, six, the, the year 640 to 740 and divides them up between pre-690 and post-690. Um, so the key points that he's, he's making is what that tells us about what was happening on the ground. He says his conclusion, while provisional, is clear. There is no rock inscription with a reference to Muhammad prior to 690, and that's the, the bombshell in, from the paper. Huge. Well, that's enormous. Huge. And even, even, even when it is finally introduced in 690, we're not even sure if that's a man. That's probably, it could be probably nothing more than blessed. Exactly. So um, some examples of findings, um, he says, of course, we, we must remember that the dated epigraphic record is still scanty, especially in the 20s to 60s, which is 640s to 680s, and drawing excessively far-reaching conclusions on the basis of it is not desirable. Thus, the arguments and suggestions presented in this article must be treated for the time being as provisional. Preferably, epigraphy should be used in unison with other types of evidence such as numismatics and so on. The numismatics, the documentation, uh, the manuscript evidence, the buildings, the Qibla, all these other things that were put, that were pulling together and all saying, looks like they're all saying the same thing. Yeah. So we see an, an evolution of Islam, according to the inscriptions, out of nowhere between 690 and 730. So that's the key period. We have indeterminate pies formally up to the 690s when the first instances of the emphasis on the prophet's surface. So no 690s is when the prophet emerges. Simultaneously, designations referring to different outgroups appear in the 690s to 710s. Following this, in the 700s to 720s, we have mentions of specifically Muslim rites, such as pilgrimage, prayer, and fasting. Notice how late yep. references to, to the Hajj, like 700s to 720s. The processes of boundary drawing and group designation are brought to a close around the 720s, 730s, when the words Muslims and Islam appear as clear references to a specific group. So this idea of in-groups and out-groups, the words Muslim and Islam had to be, as you, were, as it, as you would say, coined in order to distinguish them from the, the outsiders, the Christians and so on. We and them, yeah. Yeah, and you see that in the in the tone of the Quran, it's all about the believers and the disbelievers. Yeah. So, so even by seven thirty, Islam wasn't fully in place. He he mentions I'm not going to go through this, but he mentions that there was yet the hadith, the what there wasn't the Shari and so forth. Now, I'm going to move on to Nevo. So, having seen uh, what Ilka had to say about it. Um, the way Nevo divides things up, he's, he divides it into four chunks, whereas uh, Ilka uh, divides it just simply pre-690 and post-690. Um, and the way Nevo has, has done it is quite interesting because we see a gradual step-by-step -step evolution in the various rock inscriptions. Um, often there, these are either indeterminate monotheist or Judeo-Christian, but they're not clearly Islamic. And a common feature is a request for forgiveness. A later feature is a reference to lasting forgiveness 
or forgiveness for future sins. So that's one way we, we can date these. So let's say in the um, early part of, of the time frame, you would see request for forgiveness um, and then the, the other idea would develop at a later time. Um, Abdul Allah and Amir al Mumin are general express, expressions and they're not specifically monotheistic. So that's an important point that Neville makes. We can't assume that they are monotheistic and especially we can't assume that these are Islamic references. There could be more broader terms at the Ratsan time. means slave of Allah or servant of Allah. Yeah. And the second one means commander of the faithful. Of the faithful. So these could be any, both Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians would have used these phrases. And you see those on the coins. These phrases are used on the coins pre-Islamic. So that would not be Islamic. And that's why for Muslims who say, ah, that's proof that is Islamic. No, these are pre-Islamic. Uh, Slave of Allah was well known long before Islam. Then it took yeah. it on and then put it in, included it into the Quran. Yeah, and in fact, when Muawiyah used Amir al Mumin, Muminin, um, it was part of the you know the the believer movement where there were Jews and Christians and and various other uh, Arab sects all together, right. all sharing a yeah a monotheistic. Yeah, a um, on the back side of the very coin where he has al, uh, um, Amir al Mumin on the back side is a fire altar. Yeah, the rest of fire altar. Yeah. Um, so in this period, what's interesting, there's no inscriptions that have been found which refer to Muhammad. And notice the date, as, as far as, as late as 704. There's no reference to Bath, which re refers to resurrection. And Harsh, I think it, you pronounce it with a H there, um, Hasher, or Hasher. Hash, that's um, what, what um, uh, Murad said. <laughs> so that refers to Judgment Day. So... So key theological ideas are absent in those basic, basic texts. Um, so some examples for you. Forgive Lord of Musa. Uh, forgive Lord of Isa and Musa. And forgive Allah, Lord of Musa and Isa. So what we see in the basic texts are references to, to key people connected to the Abrahamist sect. These are Moses and Aaron, or Musa and Harun. And then the person of Isa and Ibrahim. And notice the word Isa and not yes, Yeshua, which would have been what the Christians would have used. So they distinguish Yeshua. themselves. Yeah. Yeshua is you the just, Christian reference for Jesus. Isa would be, in this case, the non Christian. But what, what, uh, what, which one are you referring to? Uh, which uh, sect are you referring to at this time? Well, this is kind of, um, this is kind of cutting edge this is something that Nevo has, has mentioned in his book and it hasn't really caught on in the common consciousness but I think he makes a, a really strong case for this group um, they're called the Abrahamist sect and they have essentially 90 percent of the beliefs that Islam uh, eventually had um, with Muhammad added as the cherry on the, on the cake um, but it existed for centuries it's it's not a, a anything new um, and actually, I'm doing a video um, on my channel in a few days, which will explain further. So if you're interested in that, I, I looked at, at the history of that sect, and there's lots of references to it in the uh, 3rd century, in the 5th century, and so on. So, um, and also, interestingly, notice where Isa is found on the rock inscriptions. They are found in 36 locations in northwest Arabia, Syria, and the Jordan, All where you don't find... All further north, there hasn't been one uh, Isa reference or inscription found in the Hejaz. Isn't that interesting? Wow, 600 miles further north. Absolutely. It's all, so coming, it's more... to it's all coming to the same conclusion. It's all pointing to the same area. Absolutely. And uh, in terms of uh, th this information, I actually got it through an intermediary from Dr. Ahmed Al-Jalad, who was kind enough to actually uh, send us a map with those uh, rock and where they are found in uh, in those locations. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a good point, I think. Um, so in addition to that, um, some more uh, examples. Forgive my Lord and my God, the one who wrote this kitab and the one who read it and then said, Amen, Lord of creation. So as you can see, no reference to Muhammad there. Yeah. Uh, we see something that looks very Islamic, but actually notice there's no reference to Muhammad again. 
in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful Allah, forgive so and so his transgressions, the earlier ones and the that's, later. That's the Bismillah right there. That's in the chapter one of the Fatiha. Uh, the, first yeah. chapter, the first verse of the first chapter, Bismillah al Rahman al Rahim, is right there up until before forgive. So it's, I would argue that what has happened is the these formula are all over the rock inscriptions and they have literally just lifted them from the rock inscriptions and used them when they were writing the dome of the rock inscriptions and also the the later quran so these are very common everything without everything's being borrowed to create this book what then is you what is really can we say has been eternal if it's all lifted from other other sources as we're seeing looks like more and more of the quran is nothing more than borrowings absolutely so then we move on to a uh, later period. So 730, 736. So this is like 40 years plus after the Dome of the Rock. And it's, it's denoted by Neville as Mohammedan, which means that it indicates some sort of um, cult of Muhammad, but it's not fully Islamic in the sense that a lot of the Islamic theology is absent. So if I give you, uh, this is quite a long example, but you can see some of the formula like the Bismillah there. And there near the bottom, you can see, forgive Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. Okay, so that's really the beginnings of references in the popular inscriptions to Muhammad. I do, I emphasize the word popular because as we'll see, the royal inscriptions come earlier than this. And this is very key because it suggests that it started with the Umayyads from the top and then it worked its way down to the grassroots, but it took 40 years for that to happen. Now, if we just carry on, um, some more examples, Amen, Lord of Muhammad and Ibrahim. So we see Muhammad has joined the, the pantheon of great people in 736, very late, uh, over 100 years after when you'd expect him to be in a rock inscription. Well, this is where Muhammad the man now takes for shape. He, absolutely, yeah. And uh, we also have... Um, uh, prophet, okay. Yeah. And so now, you know, we have a cult of personality being developed in, in the early part. Well, actually, it's a third of the way into the, the 8th century. We see a cult of personality around Muhammad developed and obviously being pushed by the Umayyads. Look, can and, I say something about this? Because remember in our previous video that you and I and Murad did, when we looked at the Dome of the Rock inscriptions, those in Dome of the Rock inscriptions written in 691, in every case where Muhammad's name there, it could be blessed, the blessed one. Uh, the messenger, the blessed messenger. In every case, it's not referring to a man. It could be. It looks like if it is referring to a man, it would be Jesus, because it then goes right into Jesus, the blessed one of the messenger. So if that is the case, and uh, the question I had asked uh, Robert Spencer about a week ago when I had him on, I asked him, well, then, and he agrees with you on this, and he's pointing to this, and I said, well, then when did Muhammad become a man? When was this Muhammad, the blessed one, then create a man who is the prophet himself? It looks like what you're saying, what the inscriptions are telling us, this doesn't come till 730. Yeah, yeah. That's another 40 so, years after Abdul Malik. Yeah, it, it. I would say it was probably not quite 730, but it was some, definitely sometime between uh, 691 and 736, but it took a long time for it to catch on it's you know it's not it's not like it was an instant hit with the people because bear in mind that probably the majority of the people at that time in arabia were pagan so you have to persuade them first of all to believe in one god which might have been a hard sell and then once they believe in one god you have to persuade them that this particular guy called muhammad is the is the prophet of allah uh, you know so it does took 40 years for them to get to get that ingrained in amongst at least some of the people. Um, okay, so but you're it, definitively saying that you're going on record June 2020. You're agreeing with Robert Spencer because he emailed me. When I asked him this to his face, I said, I want you to give me the date. He emailed me the very next day. He says, Jay, I put it to 7.30. So you and Robert Spencer are agreeing with each other. You both put it to 7.30. It looks like uh, Yehuda Neville also agrees with you when he was writing this in 2003. So three of you are also saying it's 7.30. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming that Dan Gibson also agrees with you, does he not? I couldn't, I couldn't speak for him, but, um, but it's interesting that all three of us have kind of drawn the same conclusion based on the evidence. So I'm certainly uh, 
agree there on that. And on none that of the three of you are working together. You don't even knew each other. We did. You well, you know of each other, but you've not met each other. And yet you're all coming no. to the conclusion by looking at the evidence that's on the ground. Something we've always said over and over again. What does the evidence say? Not what did the tradition say. I want to know what the evidence say. I want you to show me when Muhammad became a prophet. When was Muhammad finally chosen? It looks like what you're telling me today, it's at 730. 730 AD, yeah. between 730 and 736. Yeah. And well, also, I'm still also, on. get me convinced. Okay, <laughs> I'll work. I need to work harder on that. Well, if you look at the, the second inscription there, it says he asked Allah for Al Jannah by his love. Notice the reference to Allah's love. Can you give me any verse in the Quran where there's a reference to Allah's love? No, nope. and we had this, we brought this up on the Dome of the Rock inscriptions. This is actually a biblical yeah. reference. This yep. idea of God being loving, God as giving a love to someone and pouring on that, that is only coming out of the Judeo-Christian environment. So that would suggest to me that in terms of the final uh, Quran that we have, they, they may have had references to Allah's love in earlier versions, but they obviously got rid of that because that didn't fit in with the rest of what the Quran was trying to say. Obviously, they still kept... Uh, references to Allah's mercy and compassion and that, but specifically love is not there. And it might be to do with the ideology that they're trying to push. For example, as what you find in Surah 9, where there's a strong emphasis on fighting the unbeliever and so on. No? Well, well done. Okay, this is good. Thank you. Okay, so we move on to a third stage that Neville uh, refers to, which is late 8th century, 776. 787 and uh, here you can see in the the reference there is a clear reference to the Shahada but it's a different Shahada to what we know uh, more recently there is no God but Allah alone he has no companion and also that Muhammad is his servant and messenger so do you see how it's a three-part Shahada the three-part Shahada and it's very similar to the one we have in the Dome of the Rock on the inner ambulatories there's no yeah. God but Allah. You... La ilaha. There it is. He is not yeah. no companion. That is not in the Shahada today. Yeah. Also, that Muhammad is a servant. That is in the Shahada. So it's yeah. taken out the today. We've taken out. He has no associates or he has no companion, and put the two together. But according to this inscription, which supports what we see on the on the inner ambulatories there in the Dome of the Rock, built in 691, that idea of companion or associate, as you, as you want to call that, that was something that still that has now been eradicated or evicted or. Yeah edited out of the uh, into the Quran that we have today yeah so the Muslims today are not following the same Shahada as no. what they followed in the eighth century supports, maybe that maybe the Quran is written after this time could be um, and also from a mosque on the site of Seda Bekur which is in the Negev it says Muhammad messenger of Allah he sent him with the guidance to make it victorious over any other faith even in the face of the Mushrikun's reluctance do you notice how supremacist that message is? Yeah. And the Mushrikuns would be the same ones that we have uh, in Surah 9, Ayah 5. The Mushrikun. Mushrikuns means plural, those who commit shirk, those who commit, elevate another or a thing to uh, equal with God. Yeah. Okay, so it's moving on. Um, you see reference to Muhammad and Isa together there and Uzair. Um, and there's there's a gradual development of the theology as well there. Um, there's an attack, obviously, as you can see there, uh, on Christianity, neither begetting nor begotten. Um, and we then move on to the fourth period, which, as you can see, is in the 10th century, so very late, 912. Okay, so if we look at this one here, um, you have, in the name of Allah, the compassion of the merciful, that Allah and his angels will incline unto Muhammad and the Prophet. Allah's blessing upon Muhammad and Bashar bin Tamim wrote it. Um, the key thing I would note there is the, the use of the word incline unto Muhammad. You find similar language on the Dome of the Rock, um, and yet this word incline wasn't incorporated into the Quran. That's not That's the Quran today. So this is something that has been eradicated in the Quranic text. Yeah. And in the second example there, you can see another reference to Allah's love. So if Muslims believed in Allah being loving in the 10th century and there's no reference to Allah's love in the Quran, what might that suggest to you, Jay? <laughs> Are we pushing back the date even more? 
we could be we could be talking about that that you know that the Quran was still going through editions post the 10th you know, century. Al Kindi, famous Al Kindi, who was a Christian working in the in the courts of Al Mamun, uh, uh, the Caliph Mamun, in the early 9th century. So about um, uh, not quite, I mean, 80 years prior to this, he mentions this. And there has been that famous quote by, of him saying, you who are still creating your book, who are still writing your book. And for most people, they just dismiss that because it was so late because the tradition say the book was finished in 652, not in 833. This is 200 years too late. Well, if Al-Kindi was noting that, we now know that Al-Kindi was probably correct. But well, not only yeah. probably, he was correct because here you still see, this is still not the Quran that we have today. And if that is the case, why would they be putting in references that are Quranic, yet they're not Quranic, because that would be blasphemous. It would be absolutely derogatory. It would be creating a huge mind of stress to say nothing of the fact that they are putting, adding to God's word what they're not permitted to do. Yeah, I think there was a gradual evolution away from Christianity. They're trying to distinguish themselves from Christianity. And, and it's kind of a compliment to Christians that... <laughs> Uh, love is synonymous with Christianity, and they wanted to remove that from uh, all references in a later period, you know? So I find that fascinating. Um, and here's another one. It's quite a nice one. If you contrast that with the Quran, it's, it's just quite a contrast. Allah be kind towards him who passes on this road. There's no reference to that in the Quran. I see what you're saying. Yeah. No. Um, so we also have Allah inclined unto Muhammad more favorably than you inclined unto anyone among the former ones. So you, you can see here yeah. that now Muhammad is considered the head or the greatest among all the prophets. Whereas in the early inscriptions, typically of Muhammad, Muhammad was on the same level as the other people like Isa and Ibrahim and so on. But now he's been raised to even higher status as the, the 10th century here. This is the time that Al-Tabri is writing. This is the time that the theology is being put together. This is where the tafsir, he is the first to write down the tafsir. Right around this period, we don't have any tafsir before. And remember, the tafsir are the commentaries that explain the theology. Absolutely, so yeah. The commentaries are being put together at this time. He dies in 923, just another 11 years after this. If this is the case, then that would make sense why this theology is now coming into play. They've got to come up with their own theology. And that's why Muhammad now is taking a status even higher at this point, so that he becomes almost equated with God. And that, interestingly, there's no associate in Muhammad's as prophet. That's a contradiction in term within that shahada. Absolutely, yeah. To be associated with God, yet Muhammad's right there associating with God. So you take the yeah. associate out and just put the two together, and the shahada then becomes... A, 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 a non-contradictory theological statement of faith, which is the statement of faith that all Muslims use today. Fascinating. If you look and do a, a, a chronology of these in, inscriptions, the, in, no, he is no associate. He has uh, there is nothing known uh, comparable to him. This is right through all the shahadas in the eighth and ninth century. Here we're in the tenth century, and you're, it is still there. But now Muhammad is being elevated so that he can take his mission right alongside God. There you take out the associates and you slap him into the the shahada that we have today. The thing is, if you you have a contradiction, if you are pushing a cult of per personality about someone and you're saying that no one should be treated on, on the level with God, there's a, an inherent contradiction. So one of those propositions has got to go. And so obviously they got rid of that reference to no associates in the shahada. It was the only option they had. Which is fascinating because that's the first thing Muslims tell us today. You have equated Jesus with God. And we have said, no, you have equated Muhammad with God because you've taken out the restriction against him being an associate with God and then slapped him next to God in your shahada, which you say everywhere you go, every time every time you go and do the, every time you do the prayers, you start you know, with your, not with, sorry, start with the bismillah, sorry. But you start with this, and this is the statement of faith that you must say when you enter Mecca. This is the statement of faith that you must say when you convert to Islam. This is the statement of faith that you must say to prove that you are a Muslim. Yeah. Um, so, so in this last one here, I'm, I'll just make a quick point. You can see here there's now a development of Islamic theology, um, the idea of belief in the afterlife and the resurrection, whereas in the, we saw back in the basic text, we find an absence of references to that. So we can see a gradual evolution over this time frame, which really contradicts the Islamic tradition, which says that everything was all packaged and 
uh, done by 632. It clearly wasn't. No, this is three. This is 300 years later, and it's still not done. Now, um, these next few slides, I'm going to be looking at the royal inscriptions as, as opposed to the popular inscriptions. And this tells its own story because it, it gives us a kind of a sense of cause and effect. So which came first, the popular beliefs about Muhammad or the royal um, propaganda? And I would argue the royal propaganda came first. So I'm just going to take some examples here just to give you an idea. Um, so you can see on the map there, Taif or Taif, um, a place very, so a place close to Mecca. This is from 678, it's a, a Mu, Muawiya inscription. Now considering the date, 678, and, and its close proximity to Mecca, it surely would have a reference to either Mecca or um, Muhammad at that time, you'd expect. But here's what it says. This is the dam belonging to the servant of God, Muawiya, commander of the faithful. Abdallah bin Saksir built it with God's permission in the year 58. Allah forgive the servant of God, Muawaya, commander of the faithful, confirm him in his position and help him. Who's absent from this inscription? I would argue that uh, Muhammad is absent from the inscription and it's peculiar that there is no reference to nearby Mecca. So we can see here as far back as 678, or actually as far past the 632, maybe put it that way, quite late, there's still no reference to Muhammad, even in the royal inscriptions. In fact, if you notice there, it refers to um, commander of the faithful twice, and yet Muhammad gets no mention. So it's, it's odd. If, if everything that the Islamic tradition says about Muhammad is true, you'd expect even just a brief reference to Muhammad, but there's not. But um, if we return to the 690s, Notice who gets um, God's love be upon him. The servant of God, Abdul al-Malik, commander of the faithful, God's love be upon him, ordered to straighten this road and to make the milestones. Um, it's very similar to the formula that's often used about Muhammad, um, uh, peace be upon him. But yet here we have it first referred to Abdul al-Malik, which could be termed blasphemous, perhaps, I don't know. But... Um, so that's interesting. So that is just before the, the Dome of the Rock inscriptions. Yeah, a year before it. A year before. So if we then turn to the Dome of the Rock inscriptions, which we have seen earlier, we now suddenly see um, Muhammad introduced to the world. And uh, there is the Shahada and so on. So 692 is when you first see the Rock inscriptions. So notice how late... In the popular inscriptions, we saw a reference to Muhammad as late as the 730s, and how early, re in relative to that, the official line was being presented to the world. Do you see the point? So 40 years before the popular inscriptions, you have the Umayyads pushing out the um, Mohammedan propaganda. Yeah. Now, if we, if we turn to this one, it's unclear if it's dated to 693 or 702 because the the section in square brackets got chipped off. So it was it was it was either 70 or 80. Uh, but as you can see here, there is now a reference to the Shahada, the three-part Shahada. Um, and uh, in this one, there is no reference to Muhammad. Um, but there's the Shariq. That's the associate. That's what we've been talking about. There's no Galayla illa. And then he has no sharik. That means he has no associate. Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. So there, in the, the time of Abdul Malik, it's very clear that the Shahada included this attack against associating any with God. Exactly. And Muhammad is nothing more than a messenger of God. Yeah. So if we, if you notice the formula that's there, um, it's the servant of God, Abdul Al Malik, commander of the faithful, etc. The formula was the same in this next one. It's pretty much the same formula. Commander of the Faithful ordered the building of this fortress, um, and this has uh, this was in 728-29. Now, because of these road inscriptions and fortress inscriptions, the people are beginning to see references to the Shahada as they're walking around the place, and then people are picking up on these ideas and then 
doing the same, copying the, the, their leaders. So it's, you notice it's coming from the top down. It's not a grassroots movement at all. We're seeing it's um, a state-sponsored religion at work here in the, in the rock inscriptions. It's very fascinating. Um, so we move on then finally to the Masjid al-Harim Harim inscription. So the Masjid al-Harim is the reference that is found in the Quran to the, the holy place associated supposedly with Muhammad. And on that rock inscription, I'm not going to read it all to you, but if you look at the bottom, it says this was written in the year the Masjid al-Haram was built in the 78th year, which equates to 698 AD. Wow. So I don't know if people... Well, the place of bowing, the forbidden place where you bow, which is what the Kaaba is today, known as the Kaaba. Yeah. That, that square bill, or that rectangular building there, the center of Mecca, okay? But this is saying 698. It was built yeah. in 98. And it doesn't say rebuilt. What's, that's what's interesting. And uh, I've looked at an Islamic website which actually put in square brackets rebuilt as if it does say rebuilt, but it doesn't. <laughs> they do so that a... Islamic awareness website, which is the largest <laughs> website with all these inscriptions on it. And the, we, I know the guys who are in charge of that. Uh, it's housed there in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Uh, you can see why they put rebuilt it back. is because you can't have it beginning to be built in 698. It cannot be that late. It has to have been there since time immemorial. I mean, remember, that's where Abraham went to, to rebuild it. That was rebuilding, and that's 1900 BC. That's where Muhammad was born in 570. And that's where he moved from in 622. And you cannot have it being, it has to be there while Muhammad is living. It was still there when Muhammad died in Medina in 632. So can you see the difficulty? They have to put the word rebuilt, but the word says built. That's the first time, 698. That's late in the seventh century. Ooh, doo, doo, doo. This, is, this is actually very disturbing. And I can see why Islamic awareness has to put it in parentheses. They really meant rebuilt here. No, they yeah. didn't. They, mean, they meant built the first time. If you can imagine a book that uh, was written in the 1800s, okay, it's, let's say the early 1800s, would you expect it, it to refer to the Eiffel Tower? You wouldn't because the Eiffel Tower wasn't built yet. So the Quran refers to the Masjid al-Haram. And if it was built in 698, then surely the Quran must have been, been developed after 698. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's what it's saying to me. And that's just a plain reading. Okay, you could give a convoluted explanation. No, no, what really happened was it was rebuilt. But to me, the plain interpretation, you know, in the absence of any other evidence, would be on the face of it that they're Dan saying this refers is... to this and talks about it and he's very clear that you've got to go with the arabic that there you can't impose your own view on it just because it doesn't fit your theology yeah yeah so um yeah so as i've said it doesn't say rebuilt not not built i think we've said all of that um this means reference to the masjid al-haram in the quran could post date 698 um, it also means or that this, emphatic, might... this also means that it does not it did not exist at the time of Muhammad. You're yes. being very you're being you're being very polite there. I am, but there it, it has created major problems. And um, I, I heard scholars refer to the fact that this embarrassing rock inscription has been destroyed since the photo that I've shown you on the PowerPoint. Um, so obviously. Either um, it was accidental that this that this happened to get destroyed, or this was highly embarrassing, and they rather get rid of the evidence. But the rock inscription no longer exists. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know that. <laughs> well, if you so, don't look at what it says, it's like what they're doing in Mecca. They're cementing in the entire place around the Kaaba, cementing it right up because they want to destroy any evidence that there is no history in that city. Yeah. So um, just to conclude, then. Uh, the rock inscriptions indicate that popular devotion to Muhammad began in the 8th century after a cult of personality was inaugurated through official declarations beginning with the Dome of the Rock in 692. So what I'm saying is, start at the top, took 40 years for it eventually to filter down to the ordinary people who then became, uh, became obsessed with Muhammad and then all the Hadiths started to be generated around that same 
time frame. In fact, the, one of the purposes of the Hadiths was to help promote this cult of personality. So they had to fill out the picture about Muhammad, give him a backstory, give him um, wives, give him, you know, family history and all, all the other details that you're familiar with. Um, it was only in the 730s onwards that there is evidence of popular devotion to Muhammad as a prophet and, and a messenger. In other words, it took a hundred years before there was a popular devotion to Muhammad, which is incredibly um, awkward for those who hold to the Islamic tradition. Why is there not evidence of a popular devotion to Muhammad on the rocks? That just doesn't make sense to me. Unless, of course, there was no Muhammad to, to devote to. Exactly. And there is a hundred year silence prior to this. That indicates that Islam did not exist as a distinct religion until long after the time of Muhammad, which cast doubt on whether he had any part in starting the religion. And that's where I conclude. Well, listen, this has been exciting. I hope, you're, I hope you all are really following what Mel has done here. Mel, you've, done, you've taken a, a good bit of time, and I want to thank you for your energies and for your research and for the great mind God has given you. To be able to go and, and, and take what others have said, but to, to encapsulate it so we can understand it. It's important that we, are, that we do this kind of exercise. Remember what we've been saying. Where is Muhammad in the seventh century? Well, as we can see from these inscriptions, he is not there. There is only reference to him as the Blessed One, which comes in at 690, 691, sorry, 691, 692, much more so on the coins in 696. But if he doesn't really become an individual, a person, a prophet that they now claim to be until 730. So that's another 40 years later. And when you start to look at the inscriptions, we need to pay attention to what they're saying. I, we don't, we've already do, m mistrust everything that's from the 9th and 10th century because it's so late. We need to go back to where these events happen. That's exactly what Mel has done today. Mel, you've done a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you for all My the pleasure. work that you put into it. And listen, we'll have you back again. We'll have you do some, uh, some new material. But for okay. now, we're still asking Muslims, get down. You see the, the comment box at the bottom. Comment. Come, come and help us out. We're still asking you. Show us, show us any inscriptions that have Muhammad as a prophet from prior to 690. Don't yeah. start going back to the traditions or even show us that he was a man prior to 730. So we're putting the gauntlet out there. We're continuing <laughs> to push the gauntlet out there and we'll continue to do that. Look at the evolution of the theology of this person. Look and see how the Shahada changes between 690 to six, probably 678. In fact, it's not till... Um, in fact, up till 912, they're still 10th century. They're still bringing the Shahada that we see in six, 696 and 692. So when did this idea, when did the Shahada that we use today, when was that finally included? Don't go to the Quran. You're not going to find it there because it's separated. I want to know when the, when the Shahada, there's La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. When was that first inaugurated as one, one formula, the formula we're looking for? That's a that's our that's for you to go and find it. That's for you to do some homework. Mel, we're gonna wait and see what they come up with. And depending Looking on forward what, to. You say, what you say below, we're gonna look and see how you respond to this. We're still waiting for you Muslims to come up with a rebuttals to it. As you come up with the rebuttals, we'll probably make some more. Uh, we'll probably make some more videos because this is called peer review. This is the way we want it. We want you to review what we're saying. If I may add to the challenge, I I would be happy with one dated inscription prior to 690 anywhere in Arabia. That's all I'm asking. Just one. This Give us one. Muhammad, not the blessed one, but the man Muhammad. We're looking for one inscription that's prior to 690. That's what we got. Now listen, Al Jalal has said he's looked at 30,000 of these along with Yehud and Neville. 30,000 out of a possible 100,000. Maybe the other 60,000 we might find it. Show us it. Give it to us. Bring it for us. We would love to be able to be proven wrong. But until then, until then, here in 2000 and two, 2020, I don't, I, we are categorically saying at least up till 690, we can't still find, we still can't find Muhammad. Not the Muhammad of the traditions, not Muhammad of the Siddha, not Muhammad of the Hadith, not Muhammad of the Tafsir, not Muhammad of the Tahrik. Help us, prove us wrong, and we'll be able to shake your hand and say, fine and well dandy you have finally proved us what we've been asking but still today we cannot we cannot find what you're looking for okay mel god bless you thanks for coming on Thank board you. this has been fun until the next time My this pleasure. is mel and jay over and out Thank you.